Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you all for, for being here. A very short bit of background. I'm perhaps most uh, famous for being Simon Maxwell's successor. I was the first specialist registrar in the West Midlands specialist registrar in clinical pharmacology. And I've gone on and spent the last 15 years or so as a clinical trialist running large clinical trials in the clinical trial service unit in Oxford. And what I want to do is give you a flavour of the key concepts that matter. I suppose the first question is why should you care? Well, you may care because you're a researcher and you may end up being an investigator in a trial, either one of many investigators or the chief investigator. You may be designing trials. You may care because you're involved in grant review or sitting on funding committees. You may care because you're going to review publications. That's, if you like, the research aspect of our world. The other is the therapeutic aspect of our world, which is really where I started. You will be treating individual patients for certain there will be local prescribing policies which you will be advised to comment and influence. There will be national regulatory uh, policies, uh, paying decisions from, for example, NICE or guidelines, all of which may involve uh, you. And clinical trials are fundamental to m almost all of those decisions. So if we start back in 1963 with Austin Bradford Hill, he was the person who, if you remember, was a statistician, he wasn't a medic, who um, ran and conducted the first clinical trial of streptomycin back in the 1940s. But in 1963, presented to the uh, British Medical Association um, uh, with his take on uh, evaluation of evidence. Medical literature abounds with examples to show that the belief is of a, that an unproved treatment, new or old, must, for ethical reasons, be exhibited is unwarranted. Some treatments are valueless, some are hazardous. The whole question becomes in which circumstances can the doctor withhold or give a treatment. In other words, we don't know what we're doing. Well, if that was 1963, this is a review from 2001 to sort of make that point. In terms, if you look at the observational data, uh, looking at the effects of uh, blood pressure lowering drugs, if you look at, at people who are on blood pressure lowering drugs in an observational study versus people who are not on, an, uh, on anti, -hensi anti -hensi hypertensive drugs, you can see that in fact there is an increased risk of cardiovascular events in that observational study. Now, none of you believe that, I think. But you don't know why to believe that or not to believe that. If I presented that de novo about some other question, side effects of statins, uh, and benefits of antioxidant vitamins, and so on and so forth, and you were presented with very large observational data, there's a, very, a strong temptation to believe it. Of course, when the pro randomized trials were done, you, it was seen that lowering blood pressure is beneficial. So the randomized evidence gave us an insight and changed policy. Of course, we don't do that anymore. What we do is to look at much larger data sets. So here's a data set on patients who are being treated with statins because we're really interested in the side effects of statins. And you can see that actually within this, there's an excess risk of cataract among those who are treated with statins. Statins are bad for cataract? Potentially. So they're based on an average of two and a half years of, of follow-up. But remember that the difficulty with observational studies is you can only measure and assess what has been measured, and only to the extent that it was measured, and only to the frequency with which it was measured. These comparisons include bias. If you actually turn to the randomized trial now of 20,000 people and, and twice the length of follow-up, and you look at the 700, nearly 800 reports of cataract e extraction, you can see there's absolutely no difference when it comes to cataract. So we are already in this situation, we are continuing in this situation, where we don't know what we're doing without randomised trials. So I, my first point would be that actually trials are essential for making these decisions, whether it's at an individual level or at a policy level. And really the, the, any decision made in the absence of evidence, either because the, the trial was simply never done, or it was done but was too poor for us to believe the results, may actually harm individual patients. And this is a slide and a point I make repeatedly to regulators and ethics committees and so on when they say, oh, no, it's unethical to do such and such a trial. Well, clearly some trials are unethical. But always consider what is the ethics of not doing the trial? What persistent harm might we be causing? And I'll give you some examples later on. So, again, back to Bradford Hill. And this is the uncertainty principle. When we don't know what we're doing, we don't know if a treatment is definitely needed or definitely not needed, and each of you will have different views on that, then the most ethical thing to do is, in fact, to randomise. So the uncertainty principle is very helpful because it actually guides uh, the question. 
It divide, uh, guides our decision about eligibility criteria and it guides our interpretation of the answer. The next point I want to make is that most of our treatments aren't terribly effective on their own. So most treatments that we use widely have only moderate effects. Of course, moderate effects can change practice. You could have several treatments with moderate effects, add them all together and have a substantial effect. The prevention of cardiovascular disease was one good example. And in common conditions, a condition that affects not three patients or your clinic of patients, but millions of patients, even moderate effects can save large numbers of really important events. And of course, if we want to pick up moderate effects, we need randomization and it needs to be at scale. So here are some examples. They're over the last uh, 25 to 30 years. Thrombolysis in acute MI, 25% reduction in six-week mortality. It's not insulin. It's not a massive effect. Aspirin in acute MI, 25% reduction in six-week mortality. Statins for prevention of major vascular events, 25% reduction per millimole of low LDL cholesterol. I tell the medical students, if anybody ever asks you, what is the treatment reduction with this therapy? Well, first of all, they don't ask you if you're not using the therapy. So it's clearly not nothing. And it will almost always be around, around uh, a reduction of between about a, a fifth and a quarter because that's a moderate effect. If it was stunningly more effective that, we wouldn't have even, even needed the large-scale trial. It's a rough rule of thumb. So this is ISIS-2. Uh, you probably can't read that, but the point of this is that that is the entire case report form for the entire study. One page. This is the result. You know the result. Patients with, admitted with acute myocardial infarction, which was defined as the doctor thinks it's an acute myocardial infarction. Nothing more than that. If you've just had uh, no, routine care, 13% dead. If you had aspirin, you reduced that by about 20 to 25%. If you had streptokinase, reduced it by 25%. It was a two by two. If you got both, you reduced it by about 45%. So that's quite a nice result. It appears in the Lancet, so that's quite a prestigious journal. The ref goes up, everybody's happy. Except that our point is not to actually just publish, our point is to influence care. So this is just before the, uh, the results were published. You can see uh, in a survey of British doctors, 9% were prescribing antiplatelets. That really meant aspirin in those days. 2% fibrinolytics for acute myocardial infarction. A year later, 84%, 68%. It's changing the way doctors think. And if you work for industry, you really care about the bottom line, which is not mortality, but dollars. And so here, if you can see, is the number of treatments uh, uh, issued each quarter throughout this period. This is late 1980s. And here is the interim results announced. Here's the uh, final report. Here it is published. And you can see this colossal increase in usage. So this very simple trial changed practice. Second example. The heart protection study. This was 20,536 patients randomized to simvastatin or placebo. A reduction in major vascular events, in major coronary events, in stroke, in revascularization, four and a half thousand events. So large numbers, robust results, clinically important. But a 25% reduction, how worthwhile is that? Well, let's not think about treating one person or two people in a lipid clinic. Let's now talk about, and of course this is now topical, this wasn't so topical uh, uh, 15 years ago when we first published, if you're now talking about the right unit of treatment, which is for every one million people that I treat, what might I, what might I get for my money, what might, I, uh, what might the benefits be, you would prevent 70,000 major vascular events over five years, 14,000 over a year, or 270 per week. So I realise that a million people is a lot of people, but I, and I realise that 25% is only a modest effect. But if you can find a treatment that prevents 270 strokes, deaths from vascular disease, revascularization procedures, heart attacks every single week, then I want to know about it and we'll do the trial to prove you're right. But also these trials are useful for showing that treatments don't work. So here's the same trial, two by two factorial, looking at antioxidant vitamins, topical at the time, not topical, you'll see why in a moment. Uh, and if you look at the biomarkers, so we look at a surrogate marker, a biomarker, this combination gave a fourfold rise in beta carotene, increased uh, ascorbic acid by a third, and doubled the level of alpha tocopherol. 
So big changes in biomarkers. Vitamins are completely safe and completely useless would be a reasonable summary. In fact, vitamins are safe, vitamins are useless was the summary in the Daily Mail, and for once they got it right. So that's, those are some examples that moderate effects matter and that actually ex examining uh, um, these effects really does change policy. So what do we need in order to pick up moderate effects? Well, there are two features, and both are important. The first is that we need to avoid systematic error. That is that the differences between the two treatment groups are in some ways not just the treatment, but lots of other things. Take my cataract example. There are lots of differences between people who get cataracts and people who don't get cataracts, some of which you know about, some of which you measure, and some of which you measure properly. But it's not all going to be associated with the status. So the first is uh, systematic error, and the, uh, the, a good way to avoid that is randomization. The second is chance. And the, uh, 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 the difficulty with chance is particularly that if we're looking for moderate treatment effects, missing a moderate treatment benefit is actually really important. If we'd missed the moderate treatment effect in that study of statins, then every week 270 people more would be having a major vascular event. So there's a harm in missing the, uh, uh, um, the treatment effect, which really exists. So you need to be able to, to pick that up. Now, conceptually, trials are dead easy. You take a large number of people, a sufficiently large number of people. I must make it clear, not every trial needs to be 30,000 people. Some need to be more. Uh, so you take a sufficiently, sufficient number of people. You randomize them. You randomize them in a way that nobody knows in advance which treatment they're going to get. And then you follow them up. You follow them up uh, trying to encourage compliance with the treatment because you know the effects of not taking the treatment. The effects of not taking a treatment are always going to be the same as not taking placebo. The point of doing the study is to understand what the effect of taking the treatment is in the first place. Does the treatment work? Nobody takes the treatment. Of course it doesn't work. And then you want to capture all the relevant endpoints. So that's what we do during this period. And then analyze by the randomization, by the bit we'd had at the beginning. And I'm going to pick apart each of those pieces. So in order to make sure that we to, to put that in words, if we start with proper randomization, we need allocation concealment. You don't know what's going to happen before you put the person in the study. We need relevant outcomes in large numbers or sufficient numbers reported with appropriate accuracy. I'm going to deal with that in a minute on an adequate time scale. And I'm going to deal with all of those features as we go on. We need appropriate follow-up where we have meaningful treatment difference. We, uh, uh, we follow up as, as close to everybody as we can. And we continue to follow up people even if they stop the treatment, even if they have an event. And I'm going to return to that point repeatedly. And finally, we want an unbiased assessment of the outcomes. Uh, we want to uh, uh, assess by the intention to treat principle in all the patients as our first step. And I'm going to cover all of these points as we go on. What uh, are the things that can go wrong? What are the errors that matter? There are lots of people put in uh, extensive data checking processes, quality assurance processes, uh, uh, and layers and layers of bureaucracy. But let's think about what actually matters. The things that one must plan prospectively for are errors that would alter the decision of the patient to take part, would alter um, your decision about the safety of the patient during the clinical trial, or would alter the reliability of the results. Now, the human subject's protection is not a, uh, not a difficult concept. The reliability of the results is perhaps a little more challenging. If we have a trial in which we're saying, my treatment is better than your treatment, will randomize, then what happens if their errors are introduced? Well, the first thing to, re to, to uh, recognize is that every trial, and certainly every bit of clinical practice, has errors in it. So we're not going to end up with a perfect situation. The second is to think about the nature of those trials, if the, uh, of those errors. If those errors are random, in other words, they just happen by chance across the two groups that we've compared, my treatment being better than your treatment, then they add noise. So the ability for me to declare that my treatment is, into, is in fact better than your treatment becomes smaller. Think of this example. I want to show that my treatment lowers blood pressure more than your treatment does. Unfortunately, the sphygmomanometer I have is poorly calibrated 
uh, used badly, and sometimes the nurses just make it up because they can't, fi they, they can't find it. Okay? In those circumstances, because they don't know which treatment we're getting, and assuming that these are random, they happen equally across the two groups, then all will happen is that the assessment of blood pressure in your group and my group will both have noise in and actually will end up not being able to declare that, I, declare that I'm the winner, when of course I am. That is, if you like, conservative. So errors matter, but to the extent that they might tend towards the null, not finding effect that matters. Systematic errors are much more problematic. If my nurses measure blood pressure really accurately, and the nurses uh, who, are, who are studying the patients who get your treatment do it really poorly, then we've got a problem. If my nurses follow all the patients all the way through to the end of the study, and your nurses, uh, on the ones that get your treatment, only stop halfway through, for example, when somebody stops uh, taking the treatment, we introduce bias. If we're actually now doing not, does my, my treatment lower blood pressure better than yours, but does mine prevent heart attacks and death? Well, of course, heart attacks become, come before death. They certainly can't come after. So if I stop following everybody up at the point that they have a heart attack, then uh, if the treatment has an effect on heart attack, I'm going to miss and bias what the impact on death. So we must follow people all the way through. So how do we facilitate recruitment? How do we do these trials? The first is think of a good question. If it's not a good question, nobody will care. And the most important people that don't care is the patients. And if the patients don't want to take part, they won't. And this was a point that, I, that um, was demonstrated to a series of um, drug company executives and the FDA in some training meetings I did with them where we actually had patient advocates along who looked at a protocol which the, um, the, the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry thought was a fantastic treatment for or trial for pancreatic cancer, and they looked at it and said, we don't care about that sort of difference. We don't care about that sort of treatment. We wouldn't take part. And this was complete shock. This trial will fail because the patients don't care. I mean, it's not because they don't truly care. They care about their disease and they care about treatment. They just don't see this question as being important. So the question must be seen as important. The second is the eligibility criteria. The eligibility criteria for that uh, ISIS-2 trial were three lines. The drugs, the, the, the drugs definitely not contraindicated, the de drugs definitely uh, not indicated, and we think they've had a heart attack. Okay? So it's very easy to, to, to change your eligibility criteria so that from a very broad population you end up studying the perfect patient who doesn't exist. So the inclusion criteria are defined to try and find those people who are at high risk of having the event you're trying to prevent. And the exclusion are really only there to try and exclude people where there's a safety problem, or might be a safety problem. We'll use the uncertainty principle, of, as I've emphasised. And then the, th the, the last piece is ensure the process procedures are feasible. Things need to fit in with routine care. Doctors are busy, patients are busy, and patients may also be sick. So I've talked about some of this before. We're going to, we, it's important that the randomization is, is uh, uh, unbiased, so we don't know what's going to happen before the process, and we need to minimize post-withdrawal uh, losses to follow-up and uh, losses to treatment. So here's an example. It's a rather gross example. It's from the 1980s. This is not a Kaplan-Meier curve. I've deliberately, well, I have labeled the axes. This is days of randomization, and this is numbers of patients. This is a count of the patients actually randomized to each arm. It's a trial of radiotherapy versus chemotherapy for, I think it was melanoma, it doesn't really matter, it's some form of cancer. It was done in Russia in the 1980s. You can see that during this period here, that roughly 50-50 of the people were randomized to radiotherapy versus chemotherapy. After about a, a couple of years, we got to this point here, the one radiotherapy machine in the entire district broke down didn't stop them, they continued to randomise, only they only randomised into the chemotherapy arm for about this period here, so you get a gap up here, then the radiotherapy machine got, got uh, fixed, so they went back to randomising one to one. Nobody picked this up, including the journal in which it was published, it was only picked up in when we tried to do a meta-analysis many years later. This has clearly introduced an element of bias in the randomisation process itself. The randomization is critical. Here's a different way of, way, way of getting it wrong. So here is a trial, actually, of vitamins 
But here are uh, 6,500 patients randomized to active drug and 6,500 patients randomized to placebo. You can see that those who got the active drug were much more likely to want to take part than those who had, had been randomized to the placebo. So they were randomized first and then said, no, no, forget it. And because of this introduction of bias at this stage, they were only then, then some received the treatment, some withdrew consent, again, something of a, of a challenge, some were, some were lost to follow up, this was actually equal. But actually what they ended up doing was comparing the 6364 who received treatment against the 6377 who didn't receive treatment. And they called that intention to treat. So there must be reasons that people are not wanting to take part in the study. You need to define those before you randomize, and then when you've randomized, include everybody, not do it the other way around. What about compliance? I said that compliance matters. Well, let's think of this as a thought of experiment. Um, this is a biomarker. Let's call it LDL cholesterol. In general terms, all the big trials of, of statin versus placebo lowered LDL cholesterol by one millimole per litre. Let's imagine we set out on the study. We anticipate that one millimole per litre will reduce the risk by 20%. Sounds about right, moderate effect. Uh, we end up with a study of 8,000 people uh, with this sort of control event rate. We anticipate, and we have 91% power at 0.01. That's excellent power to pick up this important effect. Unfortunately, some of the people randomized to placebo start taking statins, and some of the people starting uh, randomized to statin say, no, I don't like that, and start taking nothing. So you get crossover. You get drop in and you get drop out, both directions. So in fact, the, diff the effect on the uh, biomarker between the two groups goes down to 0.7. So there's a drop of 0.3 millimoles per litre. That's not much. Okay, we, tried, we did a trial. We were trying to su suggest one millimole per litre. It ended up being 0.7. doesn't sound like much of a difference. Actually, the anticipated risk reduction goes down to about 14%. The power halves. So we've gone from a highly uh, robust design to a design that has a 50-50 chance. Just by this small reduction or relatively small reduction in compliance. If you want a very rough rule of thumb in outcome trials, every one patient who is non-compliant, i.e. they switch to the other arm, treatment onto placebo, placebo onto treatment, every one patient is worth two patients randomised. It makes you focus on compliance. So if we continue and we think about the, uh, the study conduct, there are many ways in which we can actually streamline the study conduct. And so one of my principal messages to you would be simple trials are easy to make complicated. It's much more challenging to make complicated trials simple. And yet actually the things that really are going to matter are getting enough outcomes that we get robust results. So data collection, recording the key study outcomes, focusing in on... on um, uh, record linkage, for example, as, as uh, providing additional uh, data, focusing any data cleaning or data checking on the things that really matter, similarly with adjudication, and centralising much of the trial management. So some lessons for choice of, of study outcomes. The first point is that there's the number of events that determine study power, not the number of patients. So if I have 50,000 patients and only one event, I haven't got much power. If I have 50,000 patients and 5,000 events, now we're talking. The second is to talk about composite outcomes. Now, the best example of a composite outcome is all-cause mortality. People say, well, mortality, why aren't all trials done on total mortality? It's sort of hard endpoint. It's the ultimate endpoint. Let me give you an example. Here is a, here is a uh, mocked-up study, essentially, of aspirin. So here's the placebo group in red. Here's the active group in blue. Now, if we treat, um, uh, do this trial in a group of people where you can see the all-cause mortality here, you can see that, of the, uh, that most of the mortality, about 80% of the mortality is vascular and only 20% is non-vascular. In this particular example, let's say that we reduce uh, vascular uh, death by 20%. In fact, we increase non-vascular uh, death by 20%. Okay, that's not quite what Aspen does, but think of it in that way. Okay, so in that circumstance, taking total mortality will be far, just fine. We'll demonstrate this benefit. Well, that's fine, but what if I want to now use this treatment in a different population? What if I want to use this in a treatment in a population that's much more typical of the general population where 50-50 people die of vascular disease versus non-vascular disease? Or a population where non-vascular disease dominates? 
So here is a situation where all I've done is to reverse from 80% vascular death to 20% vascular death. Okay, take a different population, same drug effects, and suddenly this treatment looks hazardous. So the drug is doing exactly the same things. The answer we get on this composite endpoint, which happens to be all-cause mortality, but there are lots of different composite endpoints, actually is completely reversed. And if we try and... So we, this result is not generalizable. It's not specific. This is a good way of masking the hazards that are actually uh, inherent in this particular treatment. This is a good way of ignoring the benefits that are actually in this treatment. So a composite outcome is unhelpful if it mixes potential safety with, pot with potential efficacy. Now, the next point is that I want to focus in on data quality. I showed you that randomization arm, the one where the radiotherapy machine stopped working and so on. They could have had perfect data quality, every single data point absolutely spot on. Their results would not have been reliable. Now, clearly, there are also situations, we explained earlier, where if your data are completely hopeless, then your results are probably going to be particularly hope completely hopeless. But to equate the two, that I must have accurate data in order to get a reliable result, is an oversimplification. It's actually rather harmful oversimplification, because it means what we tend to do, particularly as clinicians dealing with one patient at a time in, our, in the rest of our life, is we focus in on how, how can we make the assessment of individual people more precise. In trials, we're not trying to assess individual people. We're trying to assess individual treatments. We care what aspirin does. Mrs. Jones is important as Mrs. Jones, but we'll deal with that in our clinical world. What we want to know for this one individual, Mrs. Jones, is what is the effect of aspirin. So in, in our trials, what we're trying to do is assess the effects of the treatment, not the effects on individual patients. That's why we have a control group. That's why we randomize. So let me give you some examples. This is uh, mocked up data. This is a study of 10,000 people on active treatment and 10,000 in control. Let's imagine a situation where we have 800 events in the active treatment, 800 in the control, an odds ratio, a relative risk reduction of 22%, a Z score, so statistics for you, uh, this is clearly sig statistically significant. Okay, so if you see that result, that's a winner. Let's imagine now that we actually add in false events. So the patients over-report myocardial infarction or whatever the event is here. And we, despite our best efforts, we still have this over-reporting. But we have it at random, so it happening in both groups by chance. Well, if we were to add in 10% of extra events, we go from 890 here to 890 here and 1090 here, the risk reduction would go from 22% to 20%, and the Z-score would effectively unchange. So 10% either way, well, who cares? What happens if you add in 20% of events? Same exercise. We've gone to, from 22% to 20% to 19% risk reduction, and the Z-score stayed remarkably robust. Now, I should point out that this works because we started off with a colossal number of events. If we only had 18 events, we'd have a hell of a problem. But actually, if we only had 18 events, we have a hell of a problem anyway. And in many ways, it's actually easier to recruit large numbers of people than it is to put substantial efforts into really verifying exactly what event is, each one is, as if you can get at the truth. Because if I show a bunch of 100 cardiologists one set of clinical notes and say, is this an acute myocardial infarction, I will get, well, some will say at least two, some will say at least 101 different opinions as to what sort of myocardial infarction it is. So there is no such concept as being precise in some of these circumstances. What one can do is overcome the imprecision through the, simply the power of numbers. If we were to miss real events, we would have a similar impact. So this would be, what if there's under-reporting? Provided the under-reporting is not biased, it's not happening in one group or the other group, it's just happening by chance, then, in fact, actually, again, we get simple, uh, similar um, uh, results and similar Z-scores. And, of course, if we were thinking about, as, as the modern world is going, we're thinking about using routine hospital data or hospital episode statistics or GP data or whatever to record some of our outcomes in clinical trials. These are exactly the problems that we're facing, is that we know there's noise in there and we know there's missingness in there. If we can get 
large numbers and we randomize and we analyze by intention to treat, much of that can be overcome. Let me give you a real example now. So this is back to the heart protection study. This is this 20,536 people, 4,500 4 events, uh, a 24% uh, risk reduction. This was a year of my life when I mo first moved to Oxford and of two colleagues just adjudicating 20,000 potential clinical outcomes. And we didn't adjudicate them all. There were another 30,000, 40,000 which we didn't adjudicate at all. Okay, so colossally expensive, mind-numbing, not necessarily of terribly high quality. I mean, it is whatever it is, we did our best. And you get this beautiful result. Now, if I'd stayed in Birmingham and not moved to Oxford, and, they'd never, and, and nobody had ever adjudicated this, what would have happened? So my PowerPoint skills are not that good, so they don't completely overlap. This is adjudicated risk ratio uh, 0.76 or 24% risk reduction. I'm going to read out the confidence interval, 0.72 to 0.81. Clinically significant, statistically significant, change practice, change regulations, change NICE. This is unadjudicated, 0.72 to 0.81. Tell me that that's not going to change practice, change regulation, get published, change NICE, et cetera, et cetera power of numbers. A little bit of noise actually hasn't made an awful lot of difference. Now I'm not saying that adjudication is always wrong. There are times, even in this data, where it matters, particularly if you're trying to, for example, differentiate between things that are safety and hazard and which are clinically quite difficult to distinguish. Stroke is a really good example. Stroke is, an all -call, is, a, is a composite outcome. At the very least you have hemorrhagic stroke and you have ischemic stroke and treatments by and large, work on, it's not always true, but work on one and not the other, or some treatments actually work in opposite directions on the two. So warfarin has, has opposite effects on the two types of stroke. Differentiating those is the sort of place that you want to put your efforts into adjudication, simply to pull those two pools apart and reduce noise. What, what else can we get to evaluate medicines? Well, this is actually, um, it's sort of pre hes um, uh, at least it didn't use HES, but did use national records. So this is the heart protection study. I keep going back to it, but it's quite a useful example. Uh, this is those initial five years of follow-up. So the people who got simvastatin risk reductions compared with the people who got placebo. That study cost £20 million, which is about a tenth of what industry would pay for it, um, and probably about a twentieth of what industry would pay for it today. We then did extended follow-up through questionnaires, linkage to cancer registry, linkage to, more, uh, to the mortality registry for a further six years. And you can see the continuing benefits. These matter because this is the continuing benefits of just five years of treatment, because everybody went on to treatment at this point. So if we'd still had a, a, a placebo control, you'd expect the things to be wider. It also is helpful because, what I won't show you, but is, it showed us the persisting safety in terms of cancer and so on, long-term safety effects. Oh, and this study cost £200,000. Where else can we get valuable safety information from fairly simple reporting, even in the absence of adjudication? So this is the Thrive study. This is 20, 25,000 people, random, uh, all treated with simvastatin, Randomised to um, niacin or not. Niacin is a drug which has been around for 50 years, widely used in all the guidelines, uh, a market of $800 million uh, per year in the US. Well, we did a trial. The treatment didn't work. I won't sh show you those results. And then we looked through all the adverse event reports, or the serious adverse event reports, the hospitalisation data that were reported as the study was ongoing. And there were tens of thousands of these. And you can see that we picked up some of the known complications of, of niacin. It, diabetes, new onset diabetes. GI uh, effects, at least some of those were known already. Some of the musculoskeletal was known already. Some of the skin was known already. We also picked up adverse effects of niacin, hazards of niacin, which had not been detected over 50 years of clinical practice and whatever ever form of pharmacovigilance has been applied to niacin over the period of that 50 years. Infection increased by about, um, about a third. Uh, gastrointestinal bleeding increased by about a third. Nobody knew that. Came from simple, robust, large-scale data. 
Uh, it was an inter interesting exercise. We unblinded the results on the, I think it was something like the 15th of December 2012 on something like the 6th of January 2013. I was in front of the pharmacovigilance uh, advisory committee at EMA uh, explaining the res these results and on something like the 10th of January 2013 the drug was, was withdrawn, at least this particular formulation was, with, was withdrawn. So you can get robust safety information from quite simple data. My final couple of slides are just to talk about the intention to treat and the, ana and the analysis. Um, all, this, all the data that I've shown you, the results data, have been from intention to treat and I want to uh, emphasize particularly the errors uh, and the pitfalls of subgroup analyses. The first is that they are underpowered. If you need a trial with 5,000 outcomes to show an effect, why would you expect to see an effect if you divide that into two subgroups? At least, why would you, if you don't see an effect, why would you say, oh, there is no effect in that particular subgroup, to put it the other way around? They're often determined by factors that recorded post-randomization and on-treatment analysis, those who are compliant with the treatment. Well, hang on, in the people who are compliant with the treatment, we know who was compliant and not compliant and what the effects were in the treatment group, but in the placebo group, who are we going to compare them with? We're suddenly doing a non-randomized analysis. And many of them are data-derived. So here is a, a neat example. Here's a subgroup analysis of the ISIS-2 trial, that thrombolysis trial I showed you right at the beginning, the very simple study. Those people who had a history of, uh, of MI before the one they're presenting with, so they've had, this is their second MI, their second presentation, if you like, no effect of aspirin. Those people, this is their virgin MI, this is their first time in, a massive, at least statistically massive, reduction uh, in the risk of death at six weeks. And here's the overall effect, so we just put that into context. So, very tempting to say that I'm going to write a guideline for coronary care or nationally, and I'm going to say that if this is patient has previously been in with a myocardial infarction, they don't get aspirin. When you're writing that guideline, would you also write in this element to it as well? So this is simply taking exactly the same data and dividing it by some other Equally arbitrary, I don't know, you tell me, uh, subgroup. I think, I believe this was actually pre-specified <laughs> subgroup that says that if you're in these two star signs, wherever they are, I know they're not me other than that, I've got no idea. Uh, perhaps I should go back to the Daily Mail and, insight, in, and consult the, uh, the textbook. Uh, then it doesn't work and all the others do. To give you a more sort of realistic and a more modern example, this is a study of uh, cholesterol lowering in people with uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, overall, a risk reduction of 17%. You can see that in men, there's a clear result. In women, it crosses the line. Why does it cross the line? Because there are fewer women with fewer events. One. Two, chance. So does it not work in women? Let's think about that. Let's think about age. So if we really believe we're going to pick out subgroups, when my nephrology colleagues see somebody who's age 49, they're not going to give them lipid-lowering treatment. When they reach their 50th birthday, they start it. Should they reach their 60th birthday, they stop it again. And when they get to 70, they restart it. Clearly makes no sense at all. So the correct approach is to actually trust the overall result. That's what the study was designed to do. And you have two different questions. Question one, does the treatment work? Answer, yes. Question two, is there real evidence that it works differently in different groups of people? That's a different hypothesis with a different uh, statistical approach. Here we've got two groups. We can't rank them in one order or the other, at least I don't think we can. Uh, and here it's a test for heterogeneity. How different are these two treatment estimates? Not how different are they from, nu from the null line, how different are they from each other? The answer is P is 0.9. Here we have something that's in order. We can put into order. So you, if there was going to be an effect, you'd expect it to get gradually more or less or something, I've no idea what, as we went across from younger to older. So you want to test for trend. You're looking for, if you like, a slope. And here is a test for trend. So there's no statistical uh, evidence that these are different and there's no statistical evidence that these are different. So heterogeneity tests for trends uh, on pre-specified uh, subgroups, not defined post-randomization is more robust. So to finish, I think scale is important, 
Randomization is critical. We can actually study a broad range of uh, exposures and outcomes. We can do it over a very long period of time. And we can get levels of detail where we need them, and that we don't need the levels of detail where they're not really going to influence the results. These are the, my take-home messages. Proper randomization and intention to treat analysis, sufficient numbers, unbiased ascertainment, comparisons with the randomized group, and avoiding undue emphasis on key subgroups. Thank you.